Welcome back to Oakhaven. It is Christmas time. Uh, the woods are beautiful right now, I think, uh, because it's pretty much open and you can see for long areas. And you can get a bit better feel for the, the land. So we wanted to talk a little bit about what's green in the woods. Uh, generally, when we talk about what's green in the woods, people think about evergreens. Uh, there aren't a lot of evergreens that grow in this part of Ohio. Uh, half to two thirds of Ohio was covered by glacier, which uh, not only uh, impacted the, the topography, but also impacted the soil. Uh, so we don't really have a lot of evergreens that grow here. Uh, we do have eastern red cedar. So we're going to start off with eastern red cedar. So I say there's not many evergreens. That doesn't mean that there's not a lot to see today. As we're walking over to this uh, eastern red cedar, we passed by several orchids and some ferns and some other things that I think are going to be interesting to see. So don't, uh, don't be turned off by the fact that I was saying that there aren't any evergreens. So this is eastern red cedar. It's not actually a cedar, it's a juniper. Um, but it's actually the, the tree form that's, that's evergreen in our woods um, that's, that's most obvious. Uh, eastern red cedar is a pioneer species, so you, uh, you don't see it in mature woods necessarily. You see it uh, growing up in old fields, and then it becomes one of the first things that you you see in a woods and then other things grow up. It's not very shade tolerant, so you lose them after uh, a while eventually as the, as the tree, as the forest matures. So Christmas time, talking about evergreens, you obviously have to talk about Christmas fern. Uh, Christmas fern is green during Christmas time, where it gets its name. It grows in a bunch like this, uh, and it covers, if you can just scan through the slope here, this is a pretty steep slope, but we have slopes that are just covered with Christmas fern. It's very green and pretty at this time of year. The other thing about Christmas fern that's kind of Christmassy is you can recognize it because the pinna, if you come in close here, are kind of in the shape of a Christmas stocking. So that's one way to recognize Christmas fern. Slightly serrated and then that bump out here that looks like a Christmas stocking. Christmas fern also at the base it, the um, stipe, the stem, is covered with scales. But these are persistent. They'll stay here through the, uh, the winter. And in the spring, it will send up fiddleheads of new leaves. Uh, and we'll start the cycle all over again. So the next one I want to talk about here is spotted wintergreen. Wintergreen, obviously, because it's green in the winter. There's a number of things that are called wintergreen, so um, this should not be confused with wintergreen that you would make lifesavers out of. Um, it's in the same family, the, the Heath family, but a, a completely different plant. So this is spotted wintergreen. And there's that one isn't particularly green, but you see there's lots of places where it is definitely more green. So wintergreen, the, the genus is Chemophila. Chemophila comes from the, the Greek, meaning winter lover, Chemophilia. Philia, philia means loves. So uh, winter lover because it, uh, it shows up in the winter. Here's another evergreen, meaning that it's green during win uh, winter, but it's not particularly green. This is grape fern. It grows up in the fall and then stays around all winter and then dies back. Look how lacy that is, it's really pretty. We have a whole forest of greenery just on this one tree here. This tree is covered with different lichens, uh, lichens and moss. You can see moss is an individual plant. Remember, lichens are a combination of a fungus that's associated with an algae. So the green color com comes from the algae and then the shape comes from the fungus. So you've got a lot of very interesting lichens here. We've got these, this foliose lichen, we've got these fruiting uh, powder horn lichens here. Um, very cool and pretty. And if you just scan down, there's all sorts of shades of, of green through here. Now, down at the base of this tree is another evergreen that I don't really like to see around here. This is Japanese honeysuckle. 
very and <laughs> very invasive, aggressive, non-native plant that we're trying to get rid of. Um, and it's it's very obvious right now in the winter because it comes up and uh, it's still green. Um, it's actually not a bad time to treat it. Yeah, this is starting to die off. It, uh, it may not be a great time to treat it, um, but a week or so ago when it was still um, growing well um, to treat it with like an herbicide. Over here, speaking of non-native invasives, we've got burning bush. So I'll take advantage of an opportunity to pull out burning bush or winged euonymus, get rid of that in our woods here. Here's the other fern we were talking about, ebony spleenwort. Stays green in the winter. Ebony spleenwort has a a stipe. A here, I look at look at the back of it. It's very dark and wiry. And then the leaves are basically all the same length for most of the length of it. It doesn't get wider and narrower. It just stays all the same length. And you tell this from black spleenwort because ebony spleenwort has alternating leaves. Whereas black spleenwort, they'd be opposite each other. And you can see on the back of it, all of the sporangia as it's making spores to, uh, to continue its life. If you're interested in the life cycle of ferns, we have a whole video on the life cycle of ferns. It's really pretty fascinating. So that's ebony spleenwort. We spend a fair amount of time down in the Smoky Mountains. It's not too far away, about six hours, beautiful woods. And one of my favorite plants down there was always a rattlesnake plantain. Incredible leaf. I was pretty excited when we were walking our property and we found rattlesnake plantain, which is not a plantain, uh, it's an orchid. So this is the first of three orchids that we're gonna talk about that are up and green in the, in the winter here. So this is rattlesnake plantain. The name plantain comes from uh, the Latin planta, which means uh, the bottom of your foot. So it's supposed to look like a, a footprint, but the, uh, the rattlesnake obviously comes from this reticulated veining uh, that gives it this great, great color here. Rattlesnake plantain, that'll, that'll bloom in the summer, but it comes up and stays green in the, in the winter. It's a great time to see it. Beautiful plant. Look at this great lichen. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fun. I'm walking along it, sitting on top of the leaves. Great texture, great color, lighter underneath. Uh, I can't identify lichens very well, so that's uh, not very useful there, but it's a great... Uh, it's a great specimen. It's just cool. Okay. And I just found the one plant I was looking for that I was hoping we would see, but I didn't think we'd find it over here. This ground cedar. I have been looking for this for a couple days to include in this video. That's another classic Christmas green that uh, people used to cut and bring inside as greenery. Very cool. I should mention that this area used to be covered with honeysuckle, and if you look down the slope, there's still a lot of honeysuckle on this slope. We just finished a video on how we're clearing the honeysuckle and the, the uh, autumn olive and the, the invasives off of this the, the slope here. Uh, but this flat area we cleared quite a while ago, and I would say that you wouldn't see this much diversity if the honeysuckle were here. This kind of stuff doesn't grow underneath honeysuckle, so it's exciting to see just how much there is. Now, just come over here and appreciate <laughs> this green patch of all these different mosses. And again, I don't know my mosses very well, so we'll have to do a whole new thing on, on mosses. But we've got at least one, two, three, three different kinds of mosses. We've got this great pixie cup lichen here that's really fun. You can see the fruiting bodies coming up a little, if you can see that, actually coming over to this one. They're fun. We've got uh, beech drops growing here and little beech trees sprouting up. 
it's just fun to see the forest restoring, now coming back to the way it should be. So I've been trying to find some of the green briars. We've got three, three different green briars on our woods, three, three of the woody green briars. This is sawbriar, or white-leafed green briar. You can tell it's got this, this glaucus, or this, this waxy white coating underneath. Green on the top, often has these kind of uh, whitish spots too. These are, the whitish spots are turning kind of brown, but uh, they will have kind of whitish spots on the top often. But that's uh, that's saw briar. Uh, you tell that from the other green briars. Uh, common green briar has definite thorns on it. This has like really really fine bristles on the stem, and most importantly that that whitish underneath the the leaf. But that. They call that they call it deciduous, but almost evergreen. So in the south, it's more evergreen, and as you get further north, it's more deciduous, and we'll lose these leaves. We'll go look at another green briar, bristly green briar, which looks a lot like that. Green briar is a vine. It grows up uh, on other plants, and that's how it gets up and uh, gets its structure. This Japanese honeysuckle that is growing up this tree here. This shows you just how invasive this Japanese honeysuckle can be because it has wound its way around this little um, seedling or, or tree sapling which looks like a, maybe a, a blue ash um, but very invasive we need to get the uh, Japanese honeysuckle under control and another burning bush sneaking up behind me There's a little eastern red cedar here that when it's growing up like this, it looks a little different. So maybe we should talk about it so that you can recognize how different it looks. Look how spiky it is. You know, its leaves are just really just individual spikes compared to what the, the mature tree looks like. Let's look at that over here. You look at the leaves and they're more compound. It's not just the spikes, it's a, it's a flat group that has those little spikes on it. Looks a little different. They actually, if you look further up, then those spikes get reduced to little scales and it's a long structure with those little scales on them. So very different looks. There's two very different looks right there in the same frame, and then that other spiky looking one as it was just growing up as a, as a little seedling. Oh, actually, down below here, I mentioned that the, the saw briar sometimes has these whiter spots on the leaf. Here's the saw briar. You can tell, you know, the bottom has the white glaucous coating on it, and the top has these kind of whitish spots. A little bit of relief to those whitish spots. And then the leaf is kind of arrow shaped or triangular, roughly triangular, rounded triangular. Okay, we're into the area we've been cleaning the, or clearing out the, the slopes. But here on the path, we have another plant that's green right now. Not green because it should be, but green because it doesn't belong here and it's confused about what life is supposed to be like in this uh, climate. Um, this is autumn olive with, again, kind of like the, uh, the saw briar. It's pale green underneath and shiny green on top, um, but a very different plant. This has um, this uh, yellowish stem with kind of spots on it. Um, that's a very, very aggressive <laughs> Uh, non-native plant that we're trying to get rid of. We can weed it when it's that small. We've been cutting a lot of it on the slopes here. So as we walk along, you can see these slopes that we've been working on that are just littered with the carcasses of bush honeysuckle and autumn olive.
So growing in amongst this, this honeysuckle that I've been cutting down is the bristly green briar. Again, green leaves right now. I, this one just fell off in my hand. I don't know if that's uh, mostly because I've been disturbing this area by cutting down the honeysuckle that it's been growing on, or if it's just, it's green for a while, but then will start to lose its leaves as time goes on. Uh, bristly green briar has a green stem, roundish leaves, looks a little bit like common green briar, except that common green briar has thorns and bristly green briar is bristly. Its, its thorns are reduced to small bristles and actually I don't feel any here. It's more along the, the base. So in the older wood down here there's small little bristles and if you get to areas of it it's really bristly. The thorns on the bristly green briar are sharp and I don't know, can you see that? Um, kind of parallel, the uh, common green briar has a broad base, almost like a cat's claw, where it gets broad and then has a little bit of curve to it. The uh, common green briar is kind of a green thorn uh, with a, a dark tip. This just has these black spines. So we've cut these honeysuckles, but you can see the damage may have already been done. They're all covered with berries. That's uh, something to fight for the next few years. Honeysuckle tends to hold on to its berries because, the, to be honest, the birds don't really like them very much. There's not a lot of nutritive value to it, so the birds tend to leave them on the, the plants. And then uh, they'll eat them later on in the season when there's not much else around. As we get down here closer to Rocky Run, down by the water, here's another thing that's green all year round. Scouring Rush, or Equisetum. Scouring Rush because you can take them, the silica content in them is really high, and they're really rough. You can use them to scour a pan, and they're uh, kind of like a Brillo pad. Scouring Rush or Equisetum. You can see that where the, where the honeysuckle is protected from the wind, it's still holding its leaves, so it may qualify for evergreen right now. It, it will lose its leaves pretty quickly, but that's honeysuckle. Honeysuckle, all the honeysuckles, whether it's the Japanese honeysuckle or these bush honeysuckles, they're opposite leaved. More evergreen leaves that we don't want to see. Here's garlic mustard. We work so hard, hundreds of hours every year to get rid of garlic mustard. And there's always some that squeeze by. So here's garlic mustard. Very invasive, very prevalent plant. I need to pick this one too. But to be honest, there used to be so much more of it. I'm reaching down at the base of it and weeding out the, the root. It's a biennial. Yeah, it's a biennial, so it grows up a rosette the first year and then flowers the second year. You know, the fact that I see three in this broad area um, is actually pretty good. I feel good about that. You know, I would rather not see any, but I feel pretty good that we've only found three. At this point, that's not going to live, so I'm going to just throw it on the ground, let it dry up, and and uh, die. Well, we're walking through the wasteland right now here. So, <laughs> underneath this huge autumn olive, which again, as we say, is a, a non-native invasive, we've got Multiflora rose, which has l kept its leaves more out of confusion because it doesn't know what what uh, what it's supposed to do in this. Um, ecosystem. Multiflora rose is again a, a non-native, very invasive species too. So it has its leaves and if you look at the base of the leaf, it has feathery stipules. None of the, let's go down to this one, none of the native plants have, uh, have feathery stipules. It also has thorns on it, kind of like the, the green briar. Let's go down to this bottom one here. Um, but the thorns you can see are kind of white broad base, just like the common green briar, but 
kind of a whitish thorn down here. When I show you the, uh, the common green briar, it looks very different from that. So, multiflora rose. I would pull it, except that whenever I pull multiflora rose, I rip up my hand, so I'm not going to do that. But I will get the garlic mustard that's sitting here next to it. And then we'll come back and get this autumn olive. Look at the, uh, the holes along here. Probably a sap sucker has drilled holes all along here. It's very interesting looking, very regular pattern. Okay, we're walking through this this honeysuckle graveyard. Uh, boy, I don't like to see this. This is a, see, it's not green, <laughs> but seed pods from Tree of Heaven. So we have treated a number of Tree of Heavens in this area. Um, I don't like to see the seeds coming. We'll just pocket this and hopefully we won't have, uh, have baby Tree of Heavens coming up. But we're coming over to one of the more exciting plants in the area, an orchid. So this is Adam and Eve orchid, or putty root. Putty root because if you take the roots out, uh, you can it's actually a uh, mucilaginous material that you can actually repair uh, like crockery with it. I don't know why you would do that. It's a, I think it's a pretty rare plant here. Um, so Adam and Eve, or putty root, an orchid. Great veining, kind of like the, the rattlesnake plantain with the dark green base and then the light veins on it, except that was more reticulated. This is all parallel. It can uh, spread by rhizomes. Cool plant. This will grow up. It, uh, it brings up these new leaves in the fall, keeps the leaves through the winter, and then in the spring it will bloom. And then in the summer, it will all have died back and we won't find anything here. The last orchid that's up and green in the, the winter is this crane fly orchid. Green leaves, kind of purpley spots on the top. Almost look like the spots are kind of breaking through. But on the bottom of it, it's just astoundingly purple. <laughs> It's just so cool how green, how purple that is underneath. That, that, so that's crane fly orchid. And that's another one where the leaves come up in the fall, stay green throughout the winter, and then will die back. So when this blooms later on in the uh, late summer, uh, the leaves will be completely gone. So that's crane fly orchid. So as we walk along, I see two more plants coming up here that are green in the winter. Not necessarily things I want to be green in the winter, but there are things that are green in our woods in the winter and uh, we should all be aware of. Uh, the first one here is winter creeper. Winter creeper is a euonymus. It's a non-native, a very invasive plant. Um, you often find it in gardens because it makes a great ground cover. Um, but it's very invasive and will grow along the ground. It's not so much of a problem when it's growing along the ground here, uh, but then when it gets to a tree, it will start heading up the tree. And uh, it, once it's up in a tree, it can uh, bloom and sped, spread seeds and it gets very invasive and can completely choke out an area. So that's winter creeper. The other thing that we have ahead of us is wild garlic. Wild garlic is another non-native plant. Very prevalent. And if you smell it, you pick up that garlic flavor. It smells like chives. Non-native, not necessarily something we want in the woods, but uh, there it is. So thanks for joining me for a walk through the woods to find what's green in the winter coming this Christmas season. I think we found almost 20 things. Um, some of them native that we're excited about, some of them not native that we're not so excited about, but uh, things that we should know. So 
If you like the video, hit the like button. If you're interested in more about the woods and uh, how, to, how to manage your woodland and uh, what types of things grow in the woods, uh, we always appreciate new subscribers. Anyway, thanks for coming along.